Hello, everyone. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Give our interpreter a chance to get on screen too. Awesome. Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to the opening of hashtag StandUpFG, Latinx Youth Activism in the Willamette Valley, curated by Israel Pastrana. My name is Mariah Berlanga Shevchuk. I'm the Cultural Resources Manager here at Five Oaks Museum. Um, and welcome, we're so glad to have you here. We're all very excited to celebrate the opening of this incredible exhibition that uplifts the historic 2016 Forest Grove High School student walkouts organized via the use of the hashtag StandUpFG in response to decades of racism and cultural erasure at their school. In the exhibition, Israel examines the circuitous roots and roots of Latinx youth activism in the Willamette Valley and how their organized struggles led to the implementation of ethnic studies curriculum across the state, which then paved the way for the rest of the nation to adopt similar curricula. Um, I'd like to shout out Lulu and Liz at Tualatin Hills Parks and Rec Department for making this event possible and for helping run behind the scenes, uh, the show behind the scenes. Special thanks as well to Color Outside the Lines and THPRD for funding this exhibition and the mural installation. Thank you as well to the Reeser Family Foundation and the Oregon Cultural Trust for funding part of these activities. You'll learn more about the mural installation I just mentioned um, further on in the program. I'd also like to introduce our ASL interpreter for the day, um, Chelsea. Thanks so much for being here and for making this program accessible. A little bit of quick Zoom housekeeping before we get to the program, although I know we're all experts at Zoom by now. We will be recording tonight's program. Um, feel free to turn your cameras on or leave them off, whatever your preference, but please do stay muted. Those buttons can be found on the bottom left-hand side of your screen. And please feel free to use the chat box for comments and questions throughout the afternoon. Um, we love to interact with you all and, and we'll be, what we, the Five Oaks staff, will be active in the chat as well. Okay, um, I'd like to give a little acknowledgement as we begin this event. We encourage you to stay in your body and connect with your breath. Our bodies are a part of the land and ecosystems of this earth. Five Oaks Museum rests within a valley bounded by mountains and shaped by a slow moving river. The river bends and curves and loops around. The river does not hurry, yet the river persists. Within this valley are also wetlands, oak trees, and all of the bodies and creatures that have always lived here. This is Kalapuyan land. Since time immemorial, Kalapuyan knowledge and lifeways have embodied the truths that this land holds. Native people have always been here, are still here, and will continue to be here. The museum, our collection, and the building that houses them were created by and for settlers and their belongings. For those of us who are guests on this land, we acknowledge the harms of settler colonialism and extractive modes of taking our, our legacies, which our work must account for and reckon with as we seek to enact justice. The Five Oaks site is a historic, is a grove of historic oak trees situated near the museum that has been a gathering place for over 500 years. The site holds the complex and intersectional sense of place and community identity that our work aspires to. We honor all of these things with our presence here at this time and with our shared work at Five Oaks Museum. All right, and now what we're all here for. Um, next, we'll hear from our guest curator, Israel, and I'll share a little bit of his background before I turn it over to him. Israel Pastrana is a Chicanx or Chicano historian and educator from the San Diego Tijuana borderlands. His teaching practice employs place based pedagogical approaches that center the history and lived experiences of Black, Indigenous, and communities of color. In 2018, Pastrana worked with student activists to found Portland Community College's Ethnic Studies program. Israel, on behalf of all of us at Five Oaks Museum, I want to thank you for bringing your time, energy, talent, passion, and cultura to this platform. We cannot fulfill our commitment to uplift community stories without you, and we are honored to share the incredible work that you've done. I hope you all spend some time exploring the exhibition website after this program. And now we're handing it off to you, Israel. Thank you. Thank you, Mariah. And, and thanks everyone uh, at the staff of Five Oaks Museum for this incredible opportunity to serve it as the museum's guest curator. It's been an amazing experience. Um, I, I just want to say quickly about the guest curator program at Five Oaks, um, which was created, excuse me, to decentralize 
the museum's singular authority in their voice and storytelling. Instead, the curation and storytelling of major exhibitions at the museum, like this one, are in the hands of community members who can speak to our own history and experiences most authentically. The museum provides the platform from which truthful, multi-sided stories can be told with support, of course, from the museum staff and their cultural resources. Now, we're going to start today's, uh, this afternoon's program with a live musical performance by Joaquin Lopez. Let me tell you all a little bit about Joaquin. He is a performing artist, a musician, a mental health counselor whose work is grounded in personal transformation, self-expression, and Latino queer identity. In 2009, Joaquin released Universo, an electro-pop album that pays homage to his coming of age as a gay man. Joaquin served as the arts and culture manager and the manager of leadership development during his time at Latino Network. Recently, Joaquin was appointed by the city councilor, council, excuse me, as a creative laureate for the city of Portland. Today, Joaquin will be performing three original songs that he wrote for the exhibition. Two of those songs are written using tweets that included the hashtag StandUpFG. The third song was created during a workshop which was attended by local youth with a connection to the walkout. In the spirit of Stand Up FG, I want to encourage all of you that are with us today uh, to use that hashtag, Stand Up FG, on social media to share your thoughts, to share your comments, memories of the walkouts, or to ask questions about this opening or the exhibition. Now with that, uh, friends, it is my absolute pleasure uh, to present to you all a treasure of Portland's Latinx community. Please welcome Joaquin Lopez. De una guitarra, tarra, tarra, la guitarra, vaya usted, vaya usted a la Pugle San José, vaya usted, vaya usted a la Pugle San José. En la Pulga de San José me compré un violín. What's a violín? Yes. And it goes like this, right? And we want to say, lean, lean, violín. Okay, todos juntos. Lean, lean, violín. And then, tarra, tarra, la guitarra. Now, what makes this really fun is that you have to get into it, okay? So it's like, like this, just like you are. Lean, lean, violin, tarra, tarra, la guitarra. Okay, can we do it? Here we go. En la pulga de San José me compré un violin. Lean, lean, violin, tarra, tarra, la guitarra. Vaya usted, vaya usted a la pulga de San José. Vaya usted, vaya usted a la pulga de San José. Now, just one more. Um, En la pulga de San José me compré un, uh, una trompeta, ¿ok? Peta, peta, la trompeta. And then, lean, lean, violin. And then, tara, tara, la guitarra. You got that? Ok, here we go. En la pulga de San José me compré una guitarra. Tara, tara, la guitarra. Wait, is that right? Yeah, no. <laughs> en la pulga de San José me compré una trompeta. Peta, peta, la trompeta. Lin, lin, violin. Tarra, tarra, la guitarra. Vaya usted, vaya usted a la pulga de San José. Vaya usted, vaya usted a la pulga de San José. Okay, one more time really fast. Here we go. En la pulga de San José me compré una trompeta. Peta, peta, la trompeta. Lin, lin, violin. Tarra, tarra, la guitarra. Vaya usted, vaya usted a la pulga de San José. Vaya usted, vaya usted a la pulga de San José. Okay, muy bien. Okay, now I need you to be my music stand again. What's that? Perfect. Okay. All right. Thank you for being my music stand. Yes. All right. I'll bring it just a little. There you go. Okay. So this next song is called It Breaks My Heart. Again, it's my pleasure to be here. My name is Joaquin Lopez. And uh, tell me your name. Adrian. Adrian's helping me be a music stand. So this next song was written through a collection of tweets. 
that I got to then put together to create a story about Stand Up FG. It breaks my heart knowing how ignorant people can be, but we will stand together and we will make a difference build love not walls tiger high stands with forest grove the kids walked out walked out in solidarity to raise attention to racism in school to raise attention to racism in school. I take a stand with my fellow Latinos and the ones who came to this country for a better living. We are all humans. Stand up for scrub together. Stand up. Change starts with us. Shame on me for not joining to raise attention to racism in school. You can hurt us. But you'll never silence our voices to raise attention to racism in school. You can hurt us, but you'll never silence our voices. The love not walls. Tiger high stands with Forest Grove. The kids walked out, walked out in solidarity. We are all human. Stand up, Forest Grove, together. Stand up. Change starts with us. Shame on me for not joining to raise attention to racism in schools. You can hurt us, but you'll never silence our voices. It breaks my heart, knowing how ignorant people can be. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome. Yes. All right, now you hold that one there, okay? You're doing such a good job. Thank you so much. This next song is called, um, I think it's called To Build Bridges, Not Walls. <laughs> What's really interesting about the last song is that all of those lyrics were not mine. They were just from the community expressing themselves. And this next song was written in collaboration with students who participated in the walkouts. And now five years later, reflect on what it was like for them. You gotta stand still, my friend. <laughs> All right. I've always had a lot of rage. I felt deprived of so much knowledge. The nuestra historia. Tengo la mentalidad de apoyar y transformar. Nuestra 
comunidade. To build bridges, not walls. FG stand tall. We said no, but that's not all. A chain reaction from our call. A call to action with our peers. El pasado trae dolor, but we're still here. Solidarity creates bonds. You can't know yourself without knowing your whitewashed history. Ellos no entienden el dolor, un dolor inexplicable de nosotros. Nace el poder. To build bridges, not walls, FG stand tall. We said no, but that's not all. A chain reaction from our call. A call to action with our peers. El pasado trae dolor, but we're still here. El pasado trae dolor, but we're still here. Muchas gracias. All right. Should I get another volunteer? Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay, perfect. That's in, in, incredible. It was such an honor to work with Joaquin uh, on, on creating those songs, right? So first, uh, we generated a collection, an archive of those tweets, thousands of tweets, uh, and sent them um, to Joaquin to examine and, and create this, this beautiful um, collection of songs from. Incredibly powerful performance, and, and really I'm so grateful for his powerful and, and really heartfelt contribution to his exhibition, to this exhibition. It's been such a joy to collaborate with Joaquin and, and really with all of the art, other artists and watch them bring the voices of youth to life. And so I'm hugely indebted to Joaquin. Uh, I appreciate all that you've done for this exhibition. Um, thank you. Thank you. One of the things that I've come to realize uh, as during the process of creating this exhibition is that nearly everyone you meet in Washington County has some connection to the Stand Up FG Walkout. Um, we notice this oftentimes when my wife and I are out having dinner, we'll have a conversation and everybody seems to have a niece or a nephew, someone close to them that participated uh, on the walkouts that day, whether it was at Forest Grove or somewhere else on May 19th, 2016. The songs that Joaquin just performed really give voice to the power of that connection uh, and the way that this connection continues to shape the lives of young people who experienced Stand Up FG. You know, I also have a personal connection to Stand Up FG, uh, and that connection is one that served to inspire me to take on this project in the first place. And so if it's all right with y'all, I'd like to talk about that connection a little bit. The story of my connection to Stand Up FG starts fittingly on May 19th of 2016, when I first walked onto campus at Portland Community College's Rock Creek uh, after accepting a teaching position at the college. Now, that day, uh, my, my belongings were still, if you can believe me, loaded on my truck. I arrived on campus unannounced, uh, and I was really hoping to have an opportunity to meet with my colleague, uh, who was then Dean of Students, Narce Rodriguez. Now, Narce is a lifelong educator and activist here in Washington County and specifically in Forest Grove, and it was her who recruited me to come to Portland Community College the year before. And she did so by meeting with me in San Diego and talking to me about the impact that I could have as one of the few Latinx instructors at the college on the growing number of Latinx students at the school. Uh, that, of course, was a really powerful uh, incentive. Uh, and, you know, I, I ultimately came to, to join 
uh, this community, and I'm really, really glad that I did. And I'm very thankful for, for Narse for that. When I showed up that day, though, on May 19th, Narse was not in the office. She and so many other Latinx community leaders were sitting in the parking lot of Forest Grove High School, where they were waiting to receive hundreds of students who had organized a walkout largely on social media. Uh, and they did this by using that hashtag, uh, StandUpFG. By the time that the school day ended, there were thousands of students that had participated in solidarity actions from dozens of high schools across the Willamette Valley. And the exhibition explores this in quite a bit of depth, right? I show that, you know, as far south as Woodburn and as far north as Vancouver, students walked out to support their peers uh, at Forest Grove High School. Not only that, but the students who walked out, whether at FGHS or at other solidarity actions, they had the foresight to document their historic actions on social media. So this event wasn't just organized on social media, it was also documented there as well. And they used this hashtag StandUpFG to tag literally thousands of tweets, images, videos, and other artifacts, images of art, poems, etc. And these records, which exist today, right, on social media, they exist on Twitter and, and other sites, right, they, they constitute an archive of youth activism and of youth voice. And so I turned to these records and I relied on them extensively to create this exhibition, which I think collectively tells these documents, excuse me, collectively tell the story of one of the largest mobilizations of youth that have ever taken place in the history of Oregon. So I'm, I'm really grateful to Narse for not only bringing me to Washington County, but more importantly, for giving me the opportunity to witness the history-making actions of Latinx youth in our community. Today, Narce is the Vice President of Student Affairs, and she also serves as the Chief Equity and Diversity Officer at Pacific University. And since 2019, she also serves on this board, I'm sorry, on the Forest Grove School Board. Now, when I was preparing this program, I asked Narse to record a short video in which she reflects on her own connection to Stand Up FG and the impact that, uh, that this event has had on Latinx youth activism in our community. And so I'm pleased to share with you all today this video uh, created by someone who's very special to me uh, and who has devoted her entire career to educational justice and to the betterment of the Latinx community in Forest Grove and in Washington County. So please welcome Narce Rodriguez, who is going to be joining us uh, through this video. Excuse me one second while I set that up. All right, yeah, here we go. Let's hear from Narce Rodriguez. Hola, my name is Narcia Rodriguez, and I would like to share with you a few words. Um, this is in particular about the Forest Grove uh, High School, over in the Forest Grove High School District, um, where we had a group of um, estudiantes that did a walkout. Actually, this was on uh, May 19th of 2016. There was a situation at the district, uh, in particular at the high school, where several students took it upon themselves to build a paper wall and put it inside of the high school by a, a scare, uh, staircase. Um, so the first thing that students would see as it would come in was a paper wall that pretty much sent the message to say, go back to where you came from. As many of you may know, the Forest Grove School District, in particular the high school, has a large percentage of Latinx students, in particular many uh, Mexicanos, first generation, um, farm workers, we live in a very, I live in this, in this community. I'm also an elect, elected official for the school district at this time. I wasn't at that particular time in 2016. The story that I want to share with you is how much orgullo I have in regards to the students that uh, became, were activists really, uh, and wanted to do something to be able to step in and say, this is not good, this is not a way to oppress uh, us, and this is a youth uh, of the high school, uh, freshmen to, to seniors. So I was really impressed by how they went about it. They actually utilized their social media. My Aijada, one of uh, many students that uh, embarked on this journey of activismo and standing up for the derechos, 
um, Bianca Bermejo, along with many other students that actually now are finishing their degree, some, some of them their bachelor's and master's, you know, we're talking about several years now. So they continue to be activists, but that day they exercised that activismo and they stood up for the rights. They did walk out from the school along with hundreds of other uh, students, as well as uh, some uh, additional parents, uh, some administrators and teachers who walked along with them to make a point that not in our town, not in our school district, not at the high school, this was going to take place. So I just want to share how that was part of our historia. There are students, because we have to give the credit to them, the students um, did embark on and they did it quickly um, and very effectively. Uh, they also uh, had support. And what I mean support is uh, Solaridad kicked in by having students from the Hillsborough School District, Beaverton, and also some Oregon State uh, University students that came to be with, with them today. I was there as a parent along with some comadres um, to support our students. And uh, thank you uh, to those students. Uh, thank you to Bianca Bermejo and others who took it upon themselves to organize and go out there and stand uh, for the rights, uh, human rights of our estudiantes. And thank you for the work that you continue to do. Dr. Pa Dr. Pastrana, muchísimas gracias por uh, seguir dando historia a nuestros estudiantes. Le agradezco mucho a usted y a todo su equipo por el bonito trabajo que están haciendo. A sus órdenes, Narce Rodriguez. Um, I'm currently an elected official for the Forest Grove School District and very proud of the work that the school district is currently doing to assure that we continue to assure that our students have a sense of belonging within our district. It's not perfect, but we're making the strides. Muchísimas gracias y felicidades con tan bonito trabajo que están haciendo. Gracias. I'm so grateful um, for Narce, uh, not just for the mentorship that she's provided me um, and, and you know, serving as a role model for so many folks in this community, um, but she's in the trenches. Uh, and, and those of you who know her uh, and know her work um, know that she wasn't gonna stand by uh, when, when those walkouts took place. And so I'm very um, honored that, that she shared those words with us today. Um, very powerful testimonio that, that we get from Narce about the power of Latinx youth. Um, Narce, le agradezco mucho su apoyo y colaboración. You're a towering figure in this community and a role model for so many Latinx educators. So thank you very much. I want to talk a little bit with you all today about the design of the exhibition. Um, the choices that I made about how to tell the story of Stand Up FG and what I hope will become of this exhibition. Now, in, in talking about this, I'm going to mostly focus on the narrative elements of the exhibition, but I want to encourage all of you to spend a lot of time exploring the incredible works of art that are included in this exhibition. I'm so proud to, to be able to exhibit such an amazing collection of talented artists. I've been blown away by their generosity and their commitment to the project. Just last Tuesday, a handful of artists joined me in my classroom to talk to my students about the history of muralism. Um, we, Mariah mentioned that there's a, a project going on at, simultaneously um, for, to create some murals at THPRD. You actually might even be able to see one of those murals right behind me. I think that the, the event is starting to wrap up. The narrative that I've written, the story that I laid out of what happened on May 16th, May 19th, excuse me, um, is organized into 16 small sections, each of which is represented in the exhibition by a Loteria card. Now, most of you are probably familiar with Loteria cards, but I want to share with you just some of the images from this exhibition. I didn't think that, that in sharing my screen, I would also be losing my notes, but here I am. I think I can handle this without. Um, I uh, organized this ex ex exhibition, excuse me, around four big questions that the sections address consecutively. And so I really want to emphasize that I designed this exhibition to be put in front of youth. Right? And so the design choices, the way in which it's laid out, the fact that it reflects a game, Loteria, are all choices that are about empowering youth and centering their voices and their perspectives in the exhibition. And so the first 
quarter of the, 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 the exhibition is attempting to answer this question here, right? What was the immediate context for the walkouts that took place on May 19th, uh, 2016 of Forest Grove High School? And so the narratives er, elements here include a discussion of what led to the creation of the hashtag, which is actually made in March, several months before the first walkout, include a discussion of students testifying to their experiences of racism, and then ultimately being pushed over the threshold by the appearance of a racist banner the day before the walkouts. Part of the story that I want to share with this part of the exhibition is that it wasn't just one event that caused the walkout to take place, but rather it was the culmination of a series of events and really ones that had been building over generations. The next section of the exhibition looks to explore reasons for how and why this movement of Stand Up FG manages to spread beyond the students at Forest Grove High School. And so these sections here explore, for instance, what I call the constellation of solidarity, constellation of struggle that builds between the various high schools that are all working together to carry out these actions. Something that really stood out to me in doing the research for this exhibition is that students at Forest Grove are coordinating, are collaborating with their colleagues at Glencoe, at Forest, I'm sorry, at Hillsborough High School. And so they're being very intentional about the way that they're organizing their actions and, and making sure that at the center of this is the incident that had taken place at Forest Grove High School. So the sections here explore, for instance, the role of the 2016 election in creating, again, the context that leads up to Stand Up FG. The section on El Machete explores the long memory of students who connected recent experiences of racism to ones that they had experienced long before, or even experiences that had been passed down from generations. The section on the absence focuses on the question of punishment, how students might be punished for participating in the walkout, but also an inversion, the ways in which students themselves call out a different kind of absence. And that is the absence of teachers of color, teachers who represent them and, and their perspectives. Um, it's a really powerful section in all of these, we're really trying to center student voice. And so as you explore the exhibition, you will notice that certain narrative elements are highlighted or bolded, excuse me. And those are direct quotations that come from students. I wanted, as you read the exhibition, for it to be very clear kind of where you're seeing student voices. Um, because so often in the way that we tell these histories, those stories, or those voices rather, are marginalized. And instead we hear voices of administrators or of historians and curators. And so to me, it was really important to, to highlight as much as possible the student voice. Of course, I am a historian, and so it was important for me to draw connections between the Latinx youth activism that we saw unfold in 2016 and the very long and rich history of Latinx youth activism in Oregon. I just saw Professor Mark Rodriguez walk into the Zoom room, uh, professor of Chicano history at, at Portland State University. And so in this section, I'm trying to draw connections between the history of Colegio Cesar Chavez and the legacy of the Chicano movement here in Oregon, and the ways in which it continues to have an impact, not only on the art that we see and the murals that are standing behind me are a testament to those connections, but also pedagogically, right? The students who led Stand Up FG were clamoring for a vision of education that other folks generations before had already attempted and in fact had proven unsuccessful because they lacked the support of school administrators. And so I see this, right, Stand Up FG, the activism of young people in our community as an extension of this very much longer history of which they are a part of, right? And so these four sections focus on that long history of Stand Up FG. And then the final section, I really wanted to highlight the power of Latinx youth. Uh, and so the concept that I had in mind when I developed these last sections was the notion of community cultural wealth. 
I wanted to highlight the attributes or the assets that students of color and that the next students in particular bring with them into the classroom. And so hopefully is, is this becoming transparent by you know, the way that I've organized uh, the exhibition, but also uh, in the themes that I've chosen to highlight, you know, I'm deeply influenced by ethnic studies and the movement for ethnic studies in education in creating this exhibition. And in fact, the youth were very much motivated by similar concerns. You know, in a minute, we're going to be joined by uh, um, Dr. Excuse me, um, uh, two uh, educators, um, ethnic studies educators, who will talk a little bit more uh, about this connection. But I, I just want to say um, that. And, and I hope that this comes through in the exhibition. I really believe that on Mar I'm sorry, on May 19th, 2016, a new chapter in the history of ethnic studies started at Forest Grove High School. Um, and when we read about the history of, for instance, of HB 2845 the House bill here in Oregon, which made the state the first in the nation to require ethnic studies uh, um, curriculum, it was really pushed along, I would argue, uh, by the activism carried out by these young people. And so I think it's really important to honor their contributions to that struggle, right? I'm someone who was trained in ethnic studies history and, 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 and in, in that field, and rarely do we hear about ethnic studies activism that takes place outside of Southern California. Right. We learn about or, or the Bay Area, right? We might learn about what happens at Berkeley and at San Francisco stage. We might learn about the Chicano walkouts in 1968. But to think about these youth here in Forest Grove in Washington County being the vanguard of a movement for ethnic studies, I think is really powerful. Uh, and so this exhibition really is my attempt to uh, address what I feel has been an erasure of this really important and compelling part of the history of ethnic studies by telling a youth-centered story about Stand Up FG, about the events that inspired it, and perhaps most importantly, about how youth activism is transforming our collective future. I really want this exhibition to stand uh, as a tribute to the courage, um, vision, uh, and the commitment of Latinx youth in this Willamette Valley. Um, who, like I mentioned, for generations have been pressing us, in particular educators, to better understand their and our history, our culture, uh, and the role that education plays uh, in creating a, a more just and equitable future for all of us. Um, and so, you know, I'll put this out there that if any of you are educators uh, and would like to get this exhibition in front of students, please, it is the reason that I did this. I am not an artist or a curator. I'm an educator and a historian. And it's really important for me uh, to, to make sure that um, this incredible rich history uh, is put in front of youth uh, who I think are really going to see themselves reflected uh, in, in the story, uh, in, in the activism um, and, and in the results. And so I'm really grateful for for that opportunity. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our last two guest speakers uh, this afternoon. Um, they are Dr. Martin Alberto Gonzalez, who is an assistant professor of Chicanex studies at Portland State University. Uh, Dr. Martin received his PhD in education from Syracuse University, where he studied the experiences of Chicanex students at predominantly white institutions, obviously a topic very dear to my heart as PCC uh, is as much as we're trying, still a predominantly white institution. Uh, and my sec our second guest this afternoon is Dr. Gabriel Higuera, who is an instructor of ethnic studies at Portland Community College. Uh, Gabriel received his PhD in Mexican American studies from the University of Arizona. Gabriel is also the founder and the director of PCC's Critical Educator of Color Pathways, uh, an ethnic studies teacher pathway program with Pacific University. Y'all, it is a tremendous pleasure to introduce to y'all to welcome uh, Gabriel and Martin into the space. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, I prepared some questions for Martin and Gabriel that I shared with them ahead of time. Uh, I'm actually going to very briefly share my screen while I ask those questions so that you all have a sense of um, what it is that, that Martin and, and uh, Gabriel are, um, are responding to. Um, but let's go ahead and kick that off. Y'all ready? Well, 
So the first question uh, that I have for both Martin and uh, Gabriel um, is about this tweet, uh, which I had shared with them in advance. Now, when I first saw this tweet, this is the moment that I was convinced that a museum exhibition needed to be created about this moment. Right. It was this connection that youth were articulating between the movement that they were carrying out and ones that they had learned about generations before that really made me think about this connection. And so the question that I have for you, Martin and Gabriel, is uh, as you all think about and reflect on this tweet, first of all, what are your impressions or your reactions uh, to the message? Uh, and then secondly, and, and maybe more importantly, what do you think this tweet tells us about the connection between Latinx youth activism past and present. Now I'm gonna go ahead and share, stop sharing the screen because I wanna see Gabriel and uh, uh, Martina a little bit closer, y'all. Oh, what's happening everybody? How y'all doing? Y'all looking great out there. I appreciate y'all. Appreciate y'all so much for inviting me, Gabriel. You wanna go first or you want me to just kick it, kick it off? I got you, Gabriel. So it's, it's an honor to be here. I'm, I'm very, very grateful to be surrounded by folks who see youth as part of the solution and not part of the problem, okay? Youth are part of the solution and not part of the problem. And immediately when Israel shared that picture with me, I thought of two, I thought of two things. History repeats itself and power to the people, power to the youth. Those are the two things that came to mind. And let me, please, uh, let me know. I, I'm going to try to slow down mine because I know we got the interpreter. We got a little bit of extra time. Don't worry about that. No, okay, I'll, 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 all right then. So I'm thinking history repeats itself and youth are part of the solution and not the problem. And it's always been power to the people. Ain't no power like the power of the youth because the power of the youth don't stop. Y'all know already. Ain't no power like the power of the youth because the power of the youth don't stop. Ain't no power power of the youth because the power, the power of, the of the youth don't, don't stop. stop. I appreciate that, Israel. I know y'all hear. I know y'all saying it in your, in your heads. I know it. I know it. And so that, though, that, that picture was very inspiring. And, and I was thinking about the question that I got asked, what is the connection? The, what is the connection between past activism and present activism? And for me, it's obvious. It's obvious. The connection is that the anger, the dedication of the youth is still there to be part of the change and to see change. That's the connection. And I, and I, want, I also wanted to, the, another connection that I saw is I wanted to remind people that through the years, Activism changes, it looks differently. And I love learning from youth to hear how is it that they wanna express their concerns? How is it that they wanna see the change? How do they wanna go about it? And so one thing that, I, another connection that I saw is that the, the activism is there, but it just looks differently. The form, of act, act, the form of activism has transformed from the past. It's transformed, it looks differently. Rather than passing slips like back in the day with the notepads and now people got social media, we're gonna tweet about it. We're gonna do some TikToks. Let's mess up the algorithms, right? Let's create that hashtag. And so we are learning so much from youth as we always have historically, right? And so that's what that reminded me of. Thank y'all for your time. I appreciate that. Thank you, Martin. Gabriel, I'm curious what, what your thoughts were, and, and I'm sure that I shared that image with you probably a while ago, right? You've had an opportunity to reflect on it, reflect on it for a bit. Excuse me. Yeah, th and thank you again, everybody, for being here, and thank you, Israel, for your for your work and leadership um, to the museum and to the to the youth and community that continues to rise up. Um, what amazes me is, is is that they're smiling in the picture. People don't want to be marching in the streets. People don't want to be doing that, um, but they're still smiling. And they're probably, I mean, my, my guess is that they're smiling because they're free, you know, finally. After, after trying, to, trying to accept the status quo, like you said, that, that, that turning point where they finally said, ya basta. And, and, then, and then, then historic, historical memory kicks in. What did, our, what did people do before? Um, they would march. And that's, that's, and that's an ancient form. And these are, these are roots that people have marched before in Oregon, like you bring up in the Cesar Chavez, uh, Colegio Cesar Chavez. Um, people's families have marched before um, in, in that, that their, their legacies in those students, in those shoes. Those aren't the first miles that they've walked that were hard miles. These are people that 
we are we're communities that that are that are used to walking the hard the hard walk um and then finally to do that with purpose and in connection to education is what made it um a transformative moment like you're saying for the state of oregon at the very least what i hope is that other communities throughout the united states that are facing similar challenges of demographics um use this as a model we're not talking about teachers using lessons plans. We're talking about students across the country learning how to mobilize and teaching each other. Um, youth are the most segregated and most surveilled population in the country. And then you add color, you add gender, you add, you add other, other dynamics of intersectionality. And you can imagine how isolated and alienated people feel on a daily basis. So for the educators and for all of us, it's a, it is a sense of urgency that we need to meet their demands to be respected and treated as human beings and transform the systems um, that sometimes hold them captive, literally, for the bulk of their waking hours. And if we look at it that way, um, I think we could, we could really match their energy with our resources as, as adults, as people in, in these positions of power. I love that both of you have spoken about um, youth autonomy right, and the ways in which youth kind of learn from one another uh, and in, in sort of building a movement. Um, I, I, obviously, I think that's a beautiful thing. And I think of, you know, um, the great documents that, that, you know, inform Chicanx activism, things like El, El Plan de Santa Barbara, right, which is also a kind of manual that gets handed down from generation to generation. I, I want to ask you all a second question. And again, I'm going to screen share um, just because I want other folks to be able to see the question that I'm asking. Um, here we go. Uh, not long after the walkouts, uh, students, youth meet uh, at Centro Cultural de Washington County, where they create a set of demands, or rather they have a conversation about where their movement is going next. And so this photograph that was provided to me by Eddie Bolaños, who I see here, hey Eddie, um, uh, shows kind of what the priorities of the youth who participated in this action were. And as you can see very clearly, the most important priority was mandatory ethnic studies curriculum. In fact, it, it received more votes than the second and fourth uh, um, issues combined. And so my question to you all is, why do you think ethnic studies is such an important demand for Latinx youth, whether we're talking about in 1968 with the Chicano blowouts, or whether we're talking about 2016 uh, and Stand Up FG? Let's go to Gabriel first this time. Is that all right? We'll switch it up. Sure. I think, I think ethnic studies, and this is might sound kind of silly, but I, I, I mean it. It's when students have to take their education into their own hands and say, "You're not your 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 curriculum is is dehumanizing." They oftentimes have to occupy buildings. They have to create civil disobedience and and garner attention. So, demanding for ethnic studies, ethnic studies recognizes that people have to operate out of the law when the law is not made for you. So it's almost like Let's 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 get an amnesty for our uprising. Essentially, was what number one as an activist is like ethnic studies says we have to rise up when we're being treated like this, when we're when we're when we have more police officers than counselors on our campus. What what kind of schooling or what what future do you have in mind for me if these are is if this is my day to day? Um, and we say your Eurocentric curriculum at best and white supremacist at, at, at worst is what, what students are getting on a daily basis. Um, so the demand for ethnic studies is, the, is a demand to be treated as a human being. It's a, de, it's a demand that, that, that allows students to exercise really every right that they can muster to be treated fairly and decently as human beings and, and, to, and to recognize the history of that struggle that goes beyond the schools that they're even in. It's a, it's a history rooted in uh, anti-colonial resistance. Um, so that's why it's a, the demand for ethnic studies has to go hand in hand. Um, and what we're, gonna, what we're gonna talk about is how do we how do, we do that? Um, but yeah, that's, that's my, my uh, quick take on that. 
No, Gabriela, absolutely, I agree. And you know, this is something that students who were participating in the um, institute or the creation of ethnic studies at Portland Community College thought a lot about this, right? What are the consequences of our actions, and how do we make sure that we take care of each other from the very beginning? It's part of the demands in 1968. Let's make sure that we have amnesty for the folks who are participating, and it continues to be a concern for youth activists to take care of one another. That's wonderful. Thank you, um, Martin. Your 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 thoughts on this question about the connection between ethnic studies and youth, Latinx activism. Yeah, and the importance of the demand, right? I think that like, for me, I really want y'all to think, especially the folks of color in the space, really think about your experiences in school and think about what, if any, readings, videos, part of the curriculum spoke to you directly, spoke to your experiences, spoke to what your hermana was going, going through, spoke to what your parents were going through, spoke to what people who are undocumented are going through. People who don't speak English are going through. I'm asking myself the same question. I'm asking myself the same question. This is the same question that I still ask to this day. And so for me, ethnic studies and activism um, is something that just goes hand in hand with one of the, it's kind of like building on what Gabriel was talking about is, um, you know, taking education in your own hands. What, what, what would it look like? What, what, would it, what would it mean to ask our youth to imagine a curriculum that speaks directly to their experiences, right? And I think that like one of the things that ethnic studies does, it exposes, it exposes societal injustices and, and it covers topics that are related to youth experiences and observations and identity. And it allows for you to reflect on those experiences. It allows for you to reflect on those identities. It allows for you to, to, to reflect on those experiences and observations and then Every, and then what it does is it inspires change. That's what it does. It inspires change because they see it through the writings. They see it through the past histories. They see it in other states. They see it in their own cities, right? And so ethnic studies allows for Latinx youth and other youth of color to imagine themselves doing something greater than they could ever imagine themselves doing, right? Goes beyond what they, uh, their perceived material realities. It goes beyond their perceived material realities. And I think it's an important demand because we already know ethnic studies humanizes the folks and humanizes the people in the space, regardless of your ethnicity, regardless of your background, regardless of your socioeconomic status. It humanizes, it validates your experiences. And, and, um, but the one thing that, I, that I'm going to end off on is that I think what it also does, it recognizes youth as knowledge producers. And let's not forget that. Let's not forget that youth are knowledge producers and let's not get caught up with our titles, with our degrees, with our credentials, with our age. And, and, and erroneously, as they say, erroneously think that youth don't have anything to contribute. They are knowledge producers. Yes, they are. Let's give them a chance, right? So it gives people, especially youth in language. My bad, hold on, we got, we got a little feedback. I'm gonna have to pause somebody, hold on, give me a second. Hey, what's up, little baby in the house? I don't know. Uh, I, I'm not. I don't know how to. Okay, appreciate that. Someone's got that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, um, so the the last thing I was gonna say is that it, it, what ethnic studies does is it provides it, it provides people a language to describe the injustices that they're experiencing, the injustices that they've seen, the injustices that they had no sense how to make how to make sense of, right? They had no, no not a chance to how to make sense of it. Provides another an alternative explanation for why the world operates the way it does, right? So I'm gonna leave it at that. And, and so much of it comes from, from personal experience, right? From like their own knowledge and their own experience. We, we talk about this in my classroom, you know, when I think of the, the walkouts, right? What they were doing, literally walking. I think of the Zapatista concept of, you know, walking and asking questions, caminando y preguntando. That as they're engaging in this walking, they're becoming aware of the situation around them. I have one more question for you all. Um, and I know we're a little short on time, but I promise we can make it through. This is an important question because I see some educators in the room. The question that I have at the very end here for Martin and for Gabriel is that in addition to a requirement for ethnic studies, 
youth also called out the absence of teachers of color. And so let me just shorten the question for you. What advice do you all have or suggestions for school administrators, whether it's at Hillsboro, Beaverton, or school district, that are trying to do something to close this gap that exists between this equity gap that exists between Latinx teachers on the one hand, the absence of, uh, and, and the overrepresentation of Latinx students in these classrooms relative to those teachers. Um, Martina, I'll come to you first, and then we'll come back to Gabriel. Oh, thank you. So I, I think I have, I have two major recommendations. The first recommendation is for administrators to be very, very intentional about who they hire or who they assign for ethnic studies classes and for what reasons, okay? Because you know, in my community and, and in the folks that I hang out with, they, they always, we always say, just because you're brown doesn't mean you're down, right? What does it mean to hire a teacher of color who has internalized all the negativity that comes along with being a, a person of color in, in society and then project that on the students? People have internalized racism. People have internalized white supremacy. So administrators have to be very, very intentional about seeking out, recruiting teachers of color, Latinx teachers, who are very critical of their experiences in America, okay? And in other words, let me tell you what you shouldn't do is just put any brown person in a Latinx ethnic studies class because I've visited so many Chicano studies or ethnic studies classes where they do that and then the person doesn't know what they're doing because that's not their training. They were trained in English, but because they brown, they put them in ethnic studies, okay? So that's the first thing, okay? The second rec recommendation has to do with Retention. Yes, it has to do with retention. How are, how are administrators holding themselves accountable, holding their colleagues accountable, holding the staff accountable to also do the work? You can't just bring in one ethnic studies teacher to your school and expect change. No, it has to be a collaborative effort. That's what it has to be. It has to be a culture change, right? And so it's very important that everybody sees themselves as playing an important vital role in sustaining a, a, an inclusive, anti-racist, anti-white supremacist campus environment. It's not just that one or those two ethnic study teachers whose job it is to do that, okay? So burnout is a thing. Burnout is even more of a thing for teachers of color who are doing social justice work. If you're not familiar with Rita Coley's work, Teachers of Color Resisting Racism and Reclaiming Education, there's a resource for y'all, okay? Burnout is a thing. Burnout times 10 is even more a thing with teachers of color who are trying to do social justice, ethnic studies work in a space that invalidates that work every single day. Recruitment being intentional and retention. Beautiful, beautiful, thank you. Gabriel, uh, I'm gonna give you the last word. You've been working on this topic for a while now here in the community. I'm, I'm eager to hear what, what your thoughts yeah, just to even I totally echo everything that Martin shared with. Thank you for dropping all of that, including the the reading tip. The other thing is to just step back and recognize that, um, like a lot of our employment, like all of our sectors of employment, education has been gendered and racialized uh, for a long time, with uh, overwhelming majority being white women in our teaching force. Why is that? What's its relationship to patriarchy? But down in the nitty gritty, we need to get principals and and school districts. Um, on, on the record to commit to block hiring is not just about getting one qualified brown person to literally integrate a school. We have to use that language. We're talking about segregated professions here. And when you also look at it that way, you're looking at hundreds of families that are excluded from the middle class because of those teaching jobs. We're talking about getting a house and setting roots down. We are still rootless in places that we've been for hundreds, if not thousands of years. How is that, how is that possible? So going on to um, block hiring and then setting up mechanisms for retention for year two, year three, and year four. Where, where's the real commitment? And also just to develop more legislative uh, agendas and put real money behind this. Um, and then going to the teacher preparation programs. They're not doing the work. Uh, it's not just administrators or schools. It's our it's our colleges and universities that are pro that are maintaining this this uh, status quo, and we've seen the result uh, for the last 150 years. And it and so everybody has to roll up their sleeves um, and listen to people like like Martin and your students uh, and the students at Forest Grove about how to do things because 
we're building something new and it's not going to look like it has been in the past because that has not been working. I'm so deeply appreciative to y'all and everybody else uh, who has made this uh, program possible. Um, y'all are an incredible asset to this community. Martin, welcome to Portland. We're so happy to have you. Gabriel, you as well. You've been here for a few years now and, and really kind of made your, uh, yourself, uh, you know, place for yourself in the community. I'm so, so grateful to both of you all. Um, please check out the museum website. It is now highlighted at fiveoaksmuseum.org. Um, it'll be the featured exhibition for the academic year. Please get it in front of your students and youth. Please let me know how I can help to bring it to um, folks out in the community. I'm going to hand it over to Mariah, who's going to bring us home. And um, yeah, thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Israel. Um, and thank you, Martin and Gabriel. Thank you, Joaquin. Um, this was such a powerful program filled with so many fire bits of knowledge. And we're going to take this with us throughout the rest of our work this year and onward. Um, as your website, or sorry, your exhibition will stay on our website in perpetuity, just as a tip for all those educators in the audience. Um, and thank you, Israel, again, for curating this beautiful and important exhibition. You are 100% a curator now, so <laughs> own that title. Um, thank you as well to Liz and Lulu at THPRD for coordinating this Zoom and for the youth-centered program that preceded this event. Thank you to our rock star interpreter, Chelsea, for um, making this program accessible. And thank you, all of you, our guests, friends, and family for being here to celebrate with us. If you feel inspired to support the guest curator program or this exhibition, please consider making a donation at the link in the chat that is coming right now. Um, Five Oaks Museum as an independent nonprofit relies on the generosity of supporters like you to sustain this storytelling and preservation work, to extend access to free learning materials, and to ensure that we are account accountable to the communities we serve. Monthly donors of just $5 and higher a month receive a complimentary essential membership with all the benefits. So thanks again, um, and please stick around for maybe a first look at the Talking Walls mural gallery at THPRD. Thank you all so much for coming out. Really appreciate you. Thanks, everyone. Um, check out the art, too. I still have some of you all on here. Um, check out the art in the exhibition. It's incredible. Um, you, we've got local artists. I see Precious on the call. Um, uh, uh, so many folks uh, who contributed just amazing artworks. Um, and, and please support them uh, and their art. Um, you know, uh, follow them on social media, buy their art, commission them to do the good work that they're doing. Um, I'm so grateful to all of you all for, for your work. Thank you, Kadish, my research assistant and artist, contributing artist in the show. I'm so glad that you're here. I didn't see your name. Um, Kadish did so much of the, the um, research for this, and I'm so grateful for um, her collaboration. Uh, I, I met Kadish as a student in my History of Mexico class, and I'm so, so proud um, to be able to feature some of her artwork, but also just so grateful to the incredible research assistance that she provided to this exhibition. It was really important to me to make sure that youth were involved in the creation of this exhibition that it wasn't just about highlighting their voice, but also including them in the process of creating it. And Kadish, really, um, I'm so, so, so honored to work with you. I appreciate your everything that you've done for this exhibition. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to partake in something like this. It like, was super meaningful and impactful for me and like a one of a kind experience. And I've got to meet so many great people through it. And I'm really grateful for that. So thank you. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna shut off my camera real quick and see if I can't make the video happen for the murals and we can check that out. But um, if not, then it was so great to see all of you all. And um, please check out the exhibition, y'all.
All right, y'all, you're going to have to check out the murals in person. They are at THPRD's Terpening Complex, uh, which is on 185th. Um, these are my daughters, Victoria and Sofia, who were on site today to help paint some of the murals. I'm so grateful to them. Um, Victoria has been a really important part of the creation of this exhibition. Um, and so uh, it was really an honor to have her come and join us. And so it's so cool. Um, please check out these murals and support the artists that have contributed to this project as well. Um, Mariah just dropped the link um, and the murals will be there for you all to look at starting now. So come on down, y'all. Thanks, Israel. Adios. <laughs>